look into your crystal ball. How do you see the market going? Do you see light at the end of the the tunnel or do you see it being a bit more stormy for a little while to come? I think full focus on early stage, so when it proceeds to seed, I think there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. If we're looking just the simple metrics of the amount of new startups we saw at the beginning of the year compared to what we see now, even if we put aside the entire hype and boom around Gen AI, there's definitely a lot more interesting uh, companies, quality of, of startups we're seeing this time of the year. It's really the levels that we saw last year, or even uh, 2021. Hello and welcome to the latest episode of Tech South Cross with uh, me, James Hounslow. Uh, and today I'm delighted that we are bringing another VC uh, to the show to talk about um, today's challenging uh, climate. Uh, and I think we're going to get a lot of really useful information. So uh, we've got Avid over from stage one. How are you doing today? Very James. Thank you. Doing well and thank you for having me. No worries. I really appreciate you. Uh, taking time out. Uh, I know how uh, super busy today is now from looking at potential new deals and the efforts that go into that now, but also looking after your current portfolio. It's never been more critical to be talking to and working with the portfolio mm -hmm. to make sure that they're on the on the right path. But as exactly. a way of getting started, before we get into the information around Stage 1 Ventures um, and what you guys do, it'd be great just to have a little bit of background as to who you are. Yeah, definitely. As mentioned, I'm with Stage One Ventures. I'm a principal of the investment team of Stage One. Uh, I've been with the fund for over 18 months now, since January last year. Uh, before that, spent most of my career in consulting, uh, in fact, and that's where I got into venture investing. As part of that, my career was spent about a decade in Accenture, the global consultancy, and about five years there as part of Accenture's venture, Accenture Ventures, which is Accenture's corporate VC. As I mentioned, that's where I got into the investment space. Awesome. So you've got a lot of experience in looking at and analyzing startups, fair to say. Um, as a way of bringing on board and getting into this conversation, who is Stage 1? What do they do? Stage 1 is quite a veteran fund in the Israeli ecosystem. I've been around for just over two, 20 years now. We invest at the intersection of three main pillars. First of all, Israeli entrepreneurs, both in Israel and abroad, about maybe 20% of our companies were funded with the founder already uh, abroad. Next one would be uh, enterprise tech. So every solution which is targeting, uh, uh, which is B2B, targeting not any B2B client, but mostly mid-market to large enterprises. And lastly, early stage. Early stage, is, it's a broad term nowadays. It could be as early as seed, but as late as Series A, in fact. So we prefer to call it maybe inception stage. So it's pretty to see it, but it doesn't have to be, have any traction necessarily. It would be just a great idea and a great team. And that's interesting enough for us. Love that. So what was it that drew you to, to these guys? Because let's face it, Israel's not short of VCs and somebody with your background and knowledge, particularly coming from the consulting side been used to analyzing this stuff it's like a perfect person so what made you decide on uh, on stage one well thank you you're too kind uh, and either, i think maybe the character the most venture investors are not necessarily what you'll find uh, in the states or in the uk coming from consulting is not as common as you as be over there here yeah. many investors mostly come from a technical side but yeah. people are more like me, which are more focused on the business or from a business background, but definitely technical investors are more common here because the ecosystem here is more technically focused. Um, specifically, what drew me to stage one, I think, first of all, is the team. We're a small team. The investment team itself is just five people, the entire company, 10 people overall. But I think the strength of the team, both in terms of the experience and even more important than that, as, as people, they're just, let's say, the team are just good people. And something which is not only important as an employee, but I think it's something which I see a lot of our founders really being attracted to. They know that when you're working with people, people are going to be with you during the, the good times and the bad. 
So I think all that was a major goal for me for, uh, for stage one. And then naturally, I looked look through their portfolio, their, their successes, and I think it's a very strong team. It's a very strong fund in terms of the, the portfolio and, and, and exits they had so far. So all that put together, it's a great pull for me to, to move to stage one. For sure. Totally agree with everything you said there. Um, so probably a starting point, what I think would be uh, a really good place for, to understand, VCs uh, are fundamentally there to firstly uh, put in cash. Mm -hmm. um, but how important in today's market, um, putting money to one side and the other values that VCs bring, how... What are stage one doing to help support and have that value add in today's market to their portfolio? At the end of the day, when you look at the VC firm, it's a financial services firm. Yeah. Startups can't get funding from banks. They can't get those kinds of loans. They need to go to venture capital. So at the end of the day, what we need and what we look for are returns on our investments. So the capital we invest is the biggest value. It's always that. Yeah. Naturally, nowadays, that's not necessarily enough to attract the talent, attract the founders that you want to invest in. So I think what we try to do is, what's a few things? First of all, we try to bring value from day one, from the very beginning of the process itself, even before we invested. Would it be through um, connecting them to various subject matter experts from our ecosystem, connections that if things go well, are connections that sometimes convert into angel investments? And even if not, it's just the feedback that they provide often help the companies, at least I hope so, help the companies to to rethink what they're doing or to to adapt it to the way market really, to the solution the market really needs. Because as most startups or many startups pivot at a, at a certain stage, or at least some would pivot, it's important to do this early on as possible. So those connections are, are very important. Uh, secondly, uh, after the investment itself, we have our own VP of marketing, which is responsible for also for all of, of our value creation uh, activities. So she really helps them with connections. It'd be to all the uh, solution providers, the credits from uh, AWS or right now from OpenAI, Microsoft, however that's relevant. Doing lots of uh, workshops. We have our mar masterclass workshop, which is a weekly workshop in different areas from marketing to HR to everything, technology and everything in between for our founders to just connect them with uh, relevant stakeholders and give them insights. So we do a lot of value creation in that sense. But naturally, I think maybe the most important part or uh, in terms of value creation is our uh, how we work on a daily basis, uh, if need to, or on a weekly basis uh, with our startups. Many times, the startups we invest in our first-time founders could be Sometimes they're more experienced, sometimes they're fresh out of the out of the university or the army here in Israel. So naturally, they haven't had that much experience in, in running a company. So we really, really help on that, help them to, to build a strategy, uh, get, uh, understand what it means to run the company in terms of financial, financials and everything like that, uh, keeping the metrics, the OKRs in place. That is, I think, is very important for early stage founders, especially first time founders. And beyond that, uh, we naturally also connect with a lot of potential clients. So that's a, a value as well. But I think that the connection it's, is interesting. But at the end of the day, who, the sale itself uh, is up to the, the, the startup, up to the founders tell themselves to make the sale or to convince the client to move forward. Uh, we can make the introduction, but uh, the conversion, it's, it's up to the startup. Love that. I'd like to talk about today and the market that we find ourselves in, which is it's extremely challenging, I think, globally from my 20 years of finding great salespeople for tech companies. It's never been so hard to sell technology to people. How are you advising and helping your portfolio, particularly a lot of them are first-time founders that might want to outwork the marketplace? And it's quite frankly, in most sectors, not something you can outwork. So what are you advising? How are you supporting these guys? I think it's all about bringing, being well-prepared when you actually start facing clients. Yeah. When you invest, you mentioned it's very early stage, usually the, mark, the, the product's not even there. Yeah. Maybe there's a demo, maybe an MVP, but not much more than that. So I think after a few months, after they're actually ready to start facing the clients, I think what we help them with is mostly understanding the client needs, 
and coming well prepared to what the client uh, or what would help them understand the client needs, coming well prepared to any kind of any kind of uh, resistance that they will face from the client. These are tough times, not just for startups, but it's all across the market. So people are not as or not as uh, willing to spend, especially on new and relatively untested solutions. So, so making this making those relevant adjustments in real time by planning ahead to any type of resistance is very important, and we recommend to our to our startups to plan that way. I think for later stages, uh, I think right now one of the ways to uh, to really expand uh, your potential market or really do more with a lot less is focusing on partnerships. Mm-hmm. Partnerships are very important in the B two B space. And if you look at many companies which are much more mature, most of their sales or significant part of their sales are done through partners, through channel partners, through consultants, from lots of other resellers, whoever. So a partnership strategy, I think, is very important, especially as the company reaches started to reach scale. Interesting. I love that you mentioned the partnerships part there because it, I think it's a great way to get revenue quite quickly. It's not something that founders automatically think about. From what you've seen, what have been the advantages of seeing people working with partners, but also uh, is there any advice that you can give on finding the right partnership? Because if you look at statistics around partnerships, there's a lot more failure than success, but that doesn't mean you don't do it, right? Exactly. So let me start with the later end of the question. I think finding the right partner is not, like you mentioned, it's not easy. It's, and it's very important. First of all, you need to understand, are you looking for a technology partner, like your AWS, for example, or more of a channel par- partner? If you're looking for more of a channel partner, I think uh, you need to understand what type of services uh, that partner is going to provide. Mm. And that's very really related to the type of the product you have. If you have a very complex product, the type that you'll sell to, to banks, to insurance companies, which could require lots of uh, integration and implementation play, then... Your partner is probably more on the consulting side. You'll need your Accenture's, Deloitte's, and so on. If it's a much more a plug-and-play solution, then a reseller would be re- more, much more relevant to you. Because mm-hmm. when you look at partners, or I think that you should look at partners as a startup, as, as another type of client. Okay? You're selling basically to the partner in order for them to take it to, the, to their end client and sell. And that's hence the margin. So you, you really need to understand what will push their buttons uh, and what will make them take the bet and, uh, on you and actually pitch your solution to their own clients. So I think that's very important to, to understand. Secondly, um, you need to look at the geography. Some partners are uh, global, some are uh, focused on geography, so you need to focus correctly. I think that those are the two main things. One, le- one more thing that uh, you need to understand is that, part, as you mentioned, partnership play is slow, at least early on. You need to start to create that snowball that will yeah. need to roll and, and pick up pace eventually until it has a life of its own. And uh, like product markets fits, you sell without having, uh, having to do anything internally. So working really hard in those first two or three joint sales with a partner is very important. But once you've done that and the uh, collaboration has been uh, uh, successful, the partner will usually not always, but usually see the value and start pitching a, a, a your solution without you need to push it, to push them to it. So my advice in that way is bring the opportunity to the partner. Mm-hmm. Let's say you're still looking to sell to to bank, let's just say JP Morgan, for example. You're already speaking to the bank. Why not take it to your partner, whoever it is? It could be a reseller, it could be a consulting company, whoever. Tell them, hey, I have an opportunity with this client. Let's work on it together. Even if the partner doesn't contribute that much, still you created a win for them, they're going to want to create a win for you later on. They see the value. So that's why I think it's very important to look at them as a client, which you need to, to bring value to early on. I love that. I, I don't think I could have summed it up much better. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding that you sign a partnership and then you just wait for the deal to, to roll through. There is no silver bullet like that. It, it takes time and it takes effort on both sides. And it's definitely a give and take relationship. The, um, the more you give, the more you'll get to, to take. To move it to now to the challenges of getting funding in today's market. If you're a, an, an early stage founder who's looking for their either seed or pre-seed money, 
what should they be or preparing before coming to to see you guys that will allow you an, the easiest way to analyze if it's a company that you'd want to invest in? So first of all, I think it's very important to pick the right fund. And by right fund, look for a fund that actually invests in your stage. Look for a fund which invests in your geography and the type of solution that you're building. It could be a generalist fund like we are. It could be a more specialized fund like in cybersecurity or in DevOps or whatever. But you need to pick the right fund. I think that after you do that, look at when the fund was actually raised. Why is it important? When you look at VC at funds, usually uh, once you raise a new fund, you invest over a period of three to four years, and then you need to raise the next one. If the fund is already approaching its, let's say, fourth year, and they haven't raised a new fund yet, it might not be relevant. They might not have money to, to make new investments at the moment. Also, they're probably the, the threshold for them to invest will be higher because the last few investments they need to make. So they will be more picky. So try to find a fund which is relatively in the first two to three years since it was raised and in your specific focus area. Now, I think right now, traction is not something which is necessarily a must. Mm -hmm. It helps and it affects the amount you want to raise. But if you're without traction, you're looking to raise a pre-seed or not a very large seed, I think they mostly should focus on validation. Naturally, let's say the team is great. Let's say the technology and the idea is interesting. But what we will really be looking for is how many potential clients you spoke with. And not just spoke with to ask their interest at in general, because, yeah, I would like a jet back, but I probably won't pay $500,000 for it. You need to, to ask them in a way which you really understand if they're going to pay for it and how much. This is something we're going to ask. What's how much do you expect to, to charge for every average license? It's your ACV. So validation, I think, at this stage will be very important. After you have your initial very early sales motion, maybe you have a few, maybe you have a few customers. Uh, I think we start. We will start looking more on the type of customers you'll be able to sell to. Is it just from, let's say, friends and family, or were you able to reach them yourself? It's very important to know if the a team is able to sell. Sometimes it's a very technical team without much uh, go-to-market experience, so that could be an issue. Uh, in that case, sometimes we'll even ask that the first hire would be more someone on the go-to-market and sales side, with their, their VP sale. Um, but I think that once you start to have traction, um, it's very important to understand that point. Um, yeah, there's nothing the main point. Beyond that, it's all pretty pretty standard. Yes, we definitely come well prepared in the way that you look at, at the market itself. Uh, how do you calculate your TAM? Uh, how do you look at your competition? The competition is always very interesting and very important because it tells us two things. First of all, competition means that there is a market. Yeah. Naturally, you don't want too much competition, but some competition is good, actually. But it's also very important to understand the type of competition. Personally, for me, I think competing with a few large incumbents is preferable to competing with lots of other startups yeah, because the differentiation is more obvious. One thing that I would advise to, to founders, there is no such thing, there is no competition. Yeah. Uh, or nobody does it like us. Yeah, of course, nobody does it like you because you're building something new. But competition could be everything from another startup to Microsoft Excel. So it's very important to, to show that you understand the competition and the market. So that, that's a, an interesting new point I put on there. So I talk to founders all day, every day. And if I had a pound for every time one of them said that no one does what we do, I'd be a rich man. Particularly as I can also point to many people who do exactly what you do or in some part of it. What would you say to founders of how important it is to know who your competition is and not to be just... There isn't we what we do the best and there's no one else that does it. So I think validation calls are very important in that way. Usually the client will use some other solution or maybe even just an internally developed tool to mitigate the, uh, the problem or the pain that you're looking to solve. So validation calls will really help you with that. 
beyond that, there's definitely a lot of, of materials on, on the internet, uh, lots of research documents. Try to find a friend at the corporate that might have access to, to Gartner or do any other uh, resources, try to get some uh, some reports for them. You'll always find something, maybe unless if you're building the next I don't know, wormhole technology, so that's probably new. But beyond that, there's always something out there. So how do you go about talking to potential new founders? Do you receive pitch decks? Is that the first protocol that you see a pitch deck or how does it work? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so usually we'll receive a pitch deck or a blurb and then we'll ask for a pitch deck. Yeah. Um, I think it's important to send a deck beforehand. It allows us to, to read through it, to prepare, to come with the right questions. I know sometimes founders are a bit worried that it could be either that they think that the VC might share with other VCs, mm -hmm. which is naturally a very bad practice, very, very bad form. We don't do that and never will. But I think from my experience, most VCs won't. Yeah. If you're very worried about that, there, there's Doxin, which would naturally help. But I think the main concern I usually hear is that just the pitch doesn't work as well is in terms of a, a deck in, in terms of a deck and, and in terms of me coming in uh, coming over and pitching and presenting it to you which is totally understandable uh the answer to that is you just need to build the right deck yeah and you need naturally to put much more materials much more information in the deck itself so it will be understandable but it should not be a reason not to send a deck my main advice is stay away from one pagers Lots of people think that, yeah, it's a smaller effort. It doesn't show that too much information. It could be interesting. Usually they're not interesting enough. They leave more questions than an answers, and they will more often than not give the, right, give the wrong impression of what the company does. Take the time, do the efforts, create a deck. It doesn't have to be a very pretty deck. Make sure the spelling is correct, but other than that, and the number is correct, but it's okay if you don't take a, a designer at an early stage. If the value is there, trust us to, to, to see it. I think that's a really important part. It's going to lead on to, to, to what we're looking for in this deck and the information, the contents there. So what, what are the key bits of information that, that from your point of view, from your experience, when you're trying to evaluate a company, what are the must-have data points that a deck should have in it? First of all, the team. To the beginning of the end or the end of the deck doesn't really matter to me at least, but the team is very important in early stages. You want to to see that they have a relevant experience, relevant education, that they actually ideally face the same issues that they're looking to solve. And naturally, once you start to know who they, once you see the team itself, you probably know someone who knows them, so you can start your due diligence even before the call, before the meeting. So that's one thing. And the second part uh, is. Really, understand, really uh, presenting the, the pain point and how you're, look, how you're solving it in a way which is meaningful for the client. Why is that important? Because many times the pain point would be bothersome to the client, but not, as, not in a way which they will actually feel the need to spend on a new solution to solve it. So we don't need, just want to see that you solve this, the problem, but in a way that really helps them at the bottom line in the business. Does it generate more revenues? Does it mitigate or reduce costs? What exactly is the value? But it has to be there. And lastly, I think they end up put together the markets and the competition. Market even more importantly. We're always looking for a large market. A larger market is, is naturally better because it means there's more room for new startups, even if there's a competition. And it means that they, once the decline, sorry, that the market as it grows more significantly, even if it grows at a slower rate in some smaller market. If you are targeting more of a niche market, then the competition becomes more relevant because smaller market, then probably there won't be that much competition. So we'd like to see that as well. Like it. One of the biggest and probably arguably one of the most important factors when deciding to invest is also one of the hardest challenges to evaluate and that's the people right how do you evaluate founders and the, the team to the best ability to go right they're they're right for us it's a few things first of all when we meet them we want to see a bit of chemistry between the, us and the team it's not a must but it really helps the reason is that when we look at the investment it's a very it's a very long relationship 
when you invest in a startup, you expect to be uh, working with them for the next seven to 10 years as, a, as an early stage uh, uh, investor. So we need to, to know that, to, inter- to feel that you're going to be able to work well together. Um, not necessarily a must uh, at the first meeting, but something we're definitely looking for. Then we will look for uh, look for relevant connections at our ecosystem that know them, probably work with them in the past, served in the same uh, uh, unit in the military, board, and, and, and so on. So uh, maybe previous investors, if they're uh, still entrepreneurs and so on. So we'll try to get lots of references on that. And lastly, during the due diligence itself, we'll ask for them to connect us with references. I think the best references would be not necessarily people who work for them, but people they worked for. Because we are usually looking to understand not just if they can do a great job naturally coding or doing something very specific. Uh, we need to understand what's the potential to grow. And I think when you talk to one of their managers, I think they always, if they're, if they're doing their job right, Managers should always look at their employees as what is their potential to grow, grow and how can I uh, see them potentially even replacing me one day. So that's an insight that we can only get from managers. Uh, so I think it's a very, it's very important to want to have. Before I ask you to look into your crystal ball and tell us what you think the future and, and next year looks like from, from the market standpoint, we've reached that point in the conversation where we where we flip roles. And you get the opportunity to ask me that one question you have always wanted to ask a recruiter. So if you have that ready, fire it away. That's good. So something with me, maybe. Uh, one of my personality traits is that I really hate to fail. I hate to fail. Even, sometimes I think I even hate to fail more than I like to actually win. So I don't know if it's one of the same, but yeah. So really on that element. When once you make an introduction, once you connect uh, as a recruiter, that's a, a new CRO to to a founder, which or to a company you're working with, and a few months down the line, it doesn't really work out. They hire them, that's really really work out. So what do you do uh, in order to to make sure or, or to make sure that this type of let's say failure doesn't happen in uh, in the future? Yeah. Uh, so it's a great question. So yeah, look more often than we probably want in business that sales hires aren't quite right. So I think that what it comes down to is, is a couple of factors of what we're looking for. If you've gone on a journey, you've made a hire and it hasn't worked, then what we need to do is there needs to be some analysis gone into it to work out why it didn't work out. And that could come down to a number of things. It could be wrong person. We got the hire wrong. Why did we get the hire wrong? Look into the detail around that wrong characteristics, uh, wrong skill set, where is where has it gone wrong? But then it might be that we weren't ready. We thought we needed a CRO, but we didn't. So it's, again, making sure, particularly when to, to try and avoid those mistakes, there's lots of things that we, we look at early on. When we're looking to do a hire, particularly if you're looking to bring on a leader, it's like, why are we looking to make this hire? What does success look like? What does failure look like? And then... What do they need to be successful? Do we have all of that in play? So if we can tick through a lot of those boxes, it usually means if there's going to be a failure, it, it will normally be because we hired the wrong person and we can get that hiring process bit right. So if we do enough of the due diligence at the outset, we know what success looks like and we know what failure looks like. And normally when you ask those questions to um, a, a founder, it normally sows the seeds for a lot of thought around actually what am I looking to do here? Why do I need this person? Do I need a CRO or do I need a VP of sales? Is it too early? What's this person going to need? Do I need that right now? So that will normally put us in the best place to make sure that we don't make the mistakes. So understanding fundamentally why we are hiring this person and do we have everything in place to give them the best chance of being successful. If we tick all of those boxes, then we should be all right. If it doesn't work, we just go back through and we try and understand why, what did we get wrong? Why did we get it wrong? To make sure then it's because it's too easy to say, let's go again, let's go and find somewhere else. Or the person that came second in the interview process, are they still available? It's like we put a, a stop, we evaluate quickly, and then we put a plan in place to make sure that we don't, make the mistake um, 
again. And I am a big believer in the definition of stupid is doing the same thing again and expecting a different result, right? So you've got to change something because something wasn't right. And so it's go back and it's look and it's what do we need to do differently this time to make sure it's right? And the biggest thing is if it's going to fail it quick, yeah, that's, I'm, that's the biggest thing is you can't have someone in play for a long period of time hoping that it's going to work out and it'll change when it's not right, we need to change it. So I think it's probably covering, and in, in, in to answer your question, it's probably asking the right questions to start with before and then being able to go back over and go, where did we get it wrong? And then we know, are, have we gone too early? Um, is there a change in process or internal strategy to be able to get it to work correctly? Wrong location. It was like we wanted it to work in Israel maybe, and it's like actually – they need to be in the USA. So sometimes that can play a, um, a factor into it. Or did we just hire the wrong person, which also can be a, uh, a big factor in it? No, that's a great answer. Thank you, James. And I really like the, the structure way that you're looking at debriefing what happened and reiterating and improving for next time. Yeah, I think doing reviews is so important and understanding what you did and how you did it is across everything that you're looking to grow and do is it's the, it's the learning and uh, and understanding looking into your crystal ball before i let you get back to your to your day because i really enjoyed this conversation how do you see the market going i know you've probably got analysts looking at everything and and helping support your portfolio it is a challenging time i think it's hard to guess where the global economy is going to go but do you see light at the end of the the tunnel or do you see it being a bit more stormy for a little while to come? I think it's all focused on early stage, so the pre-seeds to seed. Uh, I think there's definitely a light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, if we're looking just the simple metrics of the amount of new startups we saw at the beginning of the year compared, compared to what we see now, uh, even if we put aside the entire hype and boom around Gen AI, there's definitely a lot more interesting uh, companies or a lot, not more, not just the numbers, I think it's the quality of, the, of startups we're seeing this time of the year. It's really the levels that we saw last year, or even uh, 2021. So I think startup, uh, starter founders are, it's nothing adaptable and they know, and it's something which really is, uh, it's a need for them to build a startup and found it after a few relatively maybe cautious months the beginning of the year, now it's really picking up. When it will actually reach the levels of last year or 2021, I don't think it will in terms of size, round sizes and valuations. Probably won't go back to the levels of 2020 or 2019. Uh, it will be more of a, of a linear trend line from where it would have been without the COVID boom. But there's a channel for pre seed and seed. If we're looking at later rounds and Series A, both mostly in B, uh, it's still pretty dark out there. Uh, it's the goal of $1 million error to raise your Series A is not that goal anymore. Growth stage startups, uh, sorry, growth stage VCs are looking a lot more on metrics related to just how efficient the company is. So I think the focus right now is not just about growth or even just how big, how much you're selling, but how efficient you are at least in those stages. Uh, I think there was some research from Carta, I think maybe for a couple of weeks ago, that showed that the valuations in A round are dropped, but not by much, but the amount of investments has dropped significantly. So that means that only the really the cream of the crop are able to raise their Series A at the moment. If you can extend your, your runway for a few more months, try to get to the end of Q1, of Q2 ideally of next year, that will be my advice. As for the early stage, I think still raising for two years is, is good enough. Not 18 months, but try to make sure that your fund lasts for two years. It's probably still good enough, but I would be much more with, uh, let's say, you, much more with your hand on the pulse of what's going on in the market and always have that plan uh, in the drawer to reduce burn at the moment's notice if you need to. Because the market is still very unpredictable. How important, you mentioned on that Series A round, 
How important is the 1 million ARR now? So you mentioned you're looking at other things. Should businesses still be looking to get to the 1 million ARR? Because it can be a challenge now. So should they delay or should they still try and go in there if they're at, say, 500, 750 ARR? Yes, if they're already approaching the 500, 750, yes, definitely should try to get to the 1 million mark. If things haven't gone as well and you're below that, I think definitely try to extend your right way. Speak with your investors, see if we can get another internal smaller round, safe maybe. It's a very good uh, uh, way to get a few angel investors which wanted to to um, invest in the previous round in the seed but couldn't. And now they could get relatively good terms on what they would have uh, in a company which is already selling several hundred thousands of dollars. So try to extend that runway and also I think maybe do some initial calls with VCs that are that you would want to raise from uh, in those rounds, trying to understand what they're exactly looking for in this market. It always changes. And if things really improve toward the beginning of next year or, or mid of next year, maybe 1 million would be good enough. But I think definitely you should look at all options at the moment. And if you're not ver- is getting very really close to AR, uh, to the 1 million, you don't see that reaching that mark within the next quarter or two, definitely try to extend your runway. Very sound advice, uh, indeed. Um, before I let you get back to your day job, uh, I know there'll be uh, a number of people waiting to talk to you. If you had a room full of entrepreneurs uh, who were about to embark on their their project and were about to start, what would be the one bit of advice that you would give to them for day one? Unfortunately, it's going to be harder than they think it is. Um and I, I'm not an entrepreneur. I never, I never started a company, and probably I never will. So maybe it's maybe it's a bit of a chutzpah from my perspective to to say to give this type of advice to entrepreneurs. But one thing that is common to all of our entrepreneurs is that it's always gets difficult. It's always more difficult than you initially expected to try to prepare for that. And I think try to prepare yourself to the hard decisions that you're going to be need to make. I think one of the things I wish I could do for every new first-time entrepreneur, which maybe haven't worked in a more of a corporate America uh, type of company, is for them to work in type of, those type of companies for like even a few months. Yeah. Uh, because one of the things you understand is that what they really know how to do well is to make those hard decisions. And with all the talks, and it's a family, it's not. It's, not, it's all about the bottom line. And as a founder, as a CEO, or, or as a C-level, you need to be able to make those hard decisions. And it's very hard sometimes because you're very, you're, it's not your baby. So you don't want to let people go. You don't want to give up on that next feature, on that next campaign, because you always see the end of the light of the tunnels. You have to be op- eternally optimistic to be a founder. But it's very easy to get lost in that, looking for that thing that will actually pull you out of the problems that you're currently in. And there will all be a rough spot at some time. So you need to realize that you have to make those hard decisions and just make them. Um, it's not easy, but that's why you're leading a company. Yeah. I think that, that is really sound advice. The It's never as easy as you think, and it's hard. It's a lot of hours. You don't get a lot of thanks for what you're doing. And also, one of the biggest challenges founders face is those hard to make decisions and they shy away from them they shy away from them for too long and it's there is particularly when it becomes from staff and wanting to knowing that the right thing is to move people on it's understanding that it's better for both people it's better for you it's better for the company and it's better for that individual and a lot of the time i speak to people i mentioned that once in your head you think that person should go they're effectively at the departure gate at the airport how often do people not get on that plane when they're at the departure gate. So it's eventually they're getting on that plane and they're taking off. So if they're at the departure gate, get them on the plane. It's best for everybody to do it sooner rather than later. And I'd, I really appreciate your time. Some really super insightful points that you've done there. It's been great talking to you. I'll let you get back to your day now. Thank you, James. It's a pleasure being on your podcast.